theories are only useful not only for the actual intellectual purpose of theorizing, of thinking how should the world work, but it is even more important that we focus on how we can apply that theory to the research questions that we're applying. So one of the questions I tell my students to ask themselves is, what are the theoretical expectations of your conceptual framework and how is your research going to answer those theoretical expectations? Hello, welcome to episode three of the Ecopolitics podcast, season two, Global Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University, co-host of the show, along with Dr. Ryan Katzorzin from the University of Ottawa, who's joining me today and will introduce today's episode. Ryan, what's on the docket for today? Well, we have uh, an episode centered on theory and methods in the study of global environmental politics. So in our last episode, we were discussing how the field of global environmental politics is in some ways a relatively new field of study. Uh, we talked about how some approach it through the gaze of international relations, and, and we'll talk more about that in an upcoming episode on great power politics in the environment. And others approach the field through more of a geographical or political ecology lens, using unsustainability as their entry point. And others still have, have started off uh, from a, a more uh, you know, scientifically grounded earth systems framework uh, with the new geological epoch of the Anthropocene serving as their foundation for examining contemporary global politics. But the point is, uh, the field is interdisciplinary. Uh, and it's very rich in terms of featuring a wide diversity of frameworks and approaches. And so to help us unpack that richness, uh, particularly at the level of theory and methodology, we have sought the help of Dr. Raul Pacheco Vega, who's an associate professor with the Methods Lab at the Facultad Latinoamericana de Ciencias Sociales, Flaxo, Mexico. For academics who spend time on Twitter, like uh, yours truly, um, Raul needs no introduction. He's developed a, an impressive following from scholars across the social and natural sciences, arts, and humanities as someone who engages deeply with the how of academic practice. You know, how do you put together a literature review? How do you actually read and retain key information in dense peer-reviewed publications? How do you appropriately match your methodological program to your theory and vice versa? And even questions like, how do you take care of yourself as a student or a faculty member in an increasingly stressful post-secondary sector? So these are just some of the questions that he's helped the broader scholarly community address. But we're especially lucky, Peter, because Dr. Pacheco Vega's research uh, deals with a number of key themes in global ecopolitics including notably resource governance and environmental public policy, among other themes. So it's an absolute pleasure to have him on this show. And I'm going to start off by asking him a question. Raul, when you think about theory in global environmental politics, what do you see as some of the most interesting theoretical approaches that scholars are bringing to the field? And how does it differ from the theoretical approaches of let's say international relations or maybe political ecology more generally? First of all, let me thank you, Ryan and Peter for inviting me to the podcast. I am delighted to be here with you. And to answer your question, I think one of the biggest issues that I see is emerging with global environmental politics theories is that it has become now a much broader, much richer, and much more interdisciplinary field. So, for example, before you would have mainstream theories of international relations as they pertain to environmental issues. So you would think, for example, of theories like realism, which is a theory, a mainstream theory in international relations, or, you know, institutionalism, but now we are moving away from very disciplinary approaches to a much more interdisciplinary approach. So, for example, instead of just centering 
our conversations on whether or not environmental non-governmental organizations are capable of really pushing forward policy change, what we are seeing now is a shift in the way we approach these questions. So we no longer question whether or not non-state actors like environmental NGOs or, for example, business associations or business interests will have an impact on global environmental governance. The way we think about it right now is we accept that these are changes that are happening and our analysis theoretically and methodologically focuses on how we can look at these changes and what are the factors that drive those changes. And for example, this is different from main political ecology, for example, where there's a relevance of scale and of space and power differentials by focusing on the international arena. So political ecology can be combined with global environmental politics theories by linking what's happening at the local scales to what's globally happening at the more global scale as well. So that's how I would say it's one of the first and most important ones. Thanks, Raul, for for getting us started here. And I think the the example you've used there is really interesting. Where political ecology, typically, at least as as the uh, this field started, was really focused primarily on on quite localized challenges and and power relations around resource use and so on. And you're talking now about how that's being brought to the the international scale and and the conversations theoretically that that starts between these theories of international relations and the more localized politics that political ecology may have typically looked at. Tell us more about this relationship between theory and method Um, and perhaps bringing in in examples from your own work. How do you see uh, both the relationship between theory and method? And maybe you can give us some specific examples of how that's developing in uh, this field of global environmental politics. This is a wonderful question, and I am delighted that that you asked this question because it's one of the most important things that I emphasize my students. So I teach research methods, and one of the ways in which I teach it is precisely telling my students that they need to link theory with what they're actually expecting to see in the world. Let me put an example. So in my co-authored paper with Amanda Murdy that was published last year, on whether or not environmental NGOs have influence on domestic politics, our theoretical expectation was that, yes, there are circumstances under which environmental, non-governmental organizations, non-state actors, have influence on domestic politics. I developed a theoretical framework called the Double Grid Framework, where I argue that there are conditions at the local level, so for example, whether or not a country is willing and able to be influenced by external forces, and also whether or not the civil society organizations are well networked. So the theoretical expectation is, yes, there will be change if an environmental NGO coalition is well networked, and if there are domestic conditions in the country where there is more influence. In my work on North American environmental activism, I have demonstrated that NGOs have changed the way in which we design environmental policy in Mexico by going to a third party, the North American Commission on Environmental Cooperation, the CEC. That means that there is an earlier work, both theoretical and empirical, that I've done and that others have done um, that shows that this is happening, right? Like there, there is real change that NGOs bring along to global environmental politics and to the global environmental arena. And that's where the link comes between the theoretical exp- expectation and the explanations. So what I tell my students is, if the theoretical expectation is that environmental NGOs will, will influence domestic poly- environmental politics, Show me cases where this is true and show me cases where this is not true. 
That's how we test theories in global environmental politics. And that's one of the key issues that I teach my students so that they can have a much more robust theoretical and empirical baggage. I'm going to jump in here uh, to, to ask a follow-up there um, and also maybe after draw that linkage again to, to method. But I was wondering what advice you give to students or colleagues for that matter who struggle with naming their theoretical approach. Do you have, what's your recommendation um, or what's your answer when you get that kind of question? Um, I, I think there's sometimes a tendency to, to push towards established theories, you know, theories that already have names out there. But as you kind of invoked in your last question, you, in this, that project you were talking about, you named your own theoretical approach. You, you kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, invented it. <laughs> so, you know, is that allowable? At what point are you, you know, what, what stage of your career are you allowed to invent your own theory? But more generally, how do you, how do you name your theory? This is a fantastic question, Ryan, and I'm going to answer it by saying that I was a junior scholar when I developed this uh, theoretical approach. I was actually in the last few years of my doctoral program when I developed this double grid framework. What happens is the following. I think that one of the problems is that we have different theories, different frameworks, and sometimes we need to teach our students how to differentiate between what a theory is and what a framework is and what are our theoretical frameworks, conceptual frameworks, and analytical frameworks. And if this sounds confusing to you, don't worry. It sounds confusing to me and to all my students. On my blog, I actually wrote a blog post on how we can write theoretical frameworks, conceptual frameworks, and analytical frameworks. Theories are more, more of the grand level or medium level range conceptual frameworks where you have an empirical result and through repeated induction, uh, you can detect whether or not there is a theory underlying. So, for example, the general theoretical under, underlying theoretical approach for institutional analysis is that an institution will guide how different actors will interact with each other. So it establishes the rules. That's a theory, a more general theory. IAD, for example, the Institutional Analysis and Development Framework, combines elements of institutional analysis with more rational choice with other elements so that we can understand a social and ecological system. That is a framework. And what Lynn said, and, and I agree, that's my approach with my own students, is think about what you're going to use as a framework. And from the framework, you can choose several elements of different theories. So, for example, rational choice is a theory, and it's a theory that establishes that individuals will behave rationally. Institutional analysis and institutionalism are theories that establish that despite you know, self-interested rational actors, the context and the rules that have been developed through time will also mediate the interactions between actors. Those are more grand theories. And I, as a scholar or as a student, or a, you know, I also tell this to my colleagues, I can combine elements of rational choice with institutionalism, with critical theory, with political ecology. Hell, there are so many combinations. So that all those combinations lead me to develop a framework. And I call this a conceptual framework. And if I use this conceptual framework to guide my analysis, then it is an analytical framework. So I know that it's, this sounds you know, very simplified, but I think that's the best way in which I can describe how we can you know, name a theory. I, I, did, I named this framework more than a theory. I named a framework that based on several theories, and that's how I developed. And nobody is too young to develop this, but developing new theories really necessitates that we test those theories with empirical data. 
Uh, thanks, Raul. You, you've, you've brought us right back to uh, where I was hoping to go next. And I, I just want to say that, you know, I'd love to get into more discussion on this idea of different levels of theory and uh, frames and conceptual frames and concepts and how they all interact. But I think that's going to be for uh, for our listeners to do in their various uh, contexts with, uh, with the us as professors or others to kind of guide that conversation. But I think you've, you've set it up really nicely for an interesting conversation there. Um, I'd like to switch now to method because you just uh, said, you know, one of the, if one of the purposes of theory is to help us predict how we might look at a situation, what might happen, um, the next uh, step then is to adopt some method for testing to see if that is indeed what is happening and to analyze the situation. I wonder if you can speak about um, perhaps going back to your example of, uh, you know, international NGO influence on domestic policy. Uh, what are some of the qualitative and perhaps quantitative methods that one might bring to examining that and, and how, you know, and, and I'd like you to develop this idea that methods and theory need to be connected here. Thank you, Peter. So the way I would approach it would be, um, and, and this is a, a great question. How do we, which methods do we use to study global environmental politics theories? And, and in this case, the, the theory, the theoretical framework that we would be examining would be the theories of NGO influence on domestic politics. So the way I've done it has been primarily ethnographic. So I sat on each and every one of the global environmental discussions of the North American uh, Commission on Environmental Cooperation, the CEC, specific to a project, the project on North American Pollutant Release and Transit Registry, the PRTR. So I spent three years of my life literally attending every meeting of non-governmental organizations with the CEC and with governments of Canada, US, and Mexico. So that is an ethnographic qualitative approach to studying NGO influence. I literally, I also used process tracing. So I literally traced the conversations that we were having at those international environmental meetings. And then I noticed whether or not that was translated into the actual code, into the actual encoding of rules, norms, and the enforcement of the rules and norms at the domestic politics level. That said, there are other ways to study global environmental politics and specifically NGO influence by using quantitative methods. So in the paper that I published with Amanda Murdy, uh, professor of, of international relations at the University of Georgia, she and I ran models to see if there were associations or correlations between reductions in emissions and actual activism measured by intensity of lobbying and measured by intensity of network associations. So those are two of the different ways in which you can study whether there is or not environmental geo. But that again links with whether or not you have a robust theoretical framework. So Amanda had done a lot of earlier work on quantitatively assessing whether or not norms of human rights and environmental NGOs in human rights had an impact at the domestic level. So what we did is we translated those and operationalized our variables in a quantitative way to see if the performance of human rights NGOs could be translated into the performance of environmental NGOs. We didn't just copy and paste and we didn't just you know, run the same models, but we had to think through very clearly how my theoretical model of NGO influence could be actually quantified. The kind of conceptual methods that I've used to develop my theory of NGO influence are very much driven by knowing how NGOs influence global environmental politics. They participate in meetings, they participate in, they, they write letters, they participate in campaigns, in marches, and so on. These are phenomena that can be easily observed 
by you know using ethnographic approaches. It's much more complicated to develop a causal or even correlational link between what's happening on the ground in terms of you know e emission reduction as opposed to, for example, doing the same kind of work with environmental NGOs as you observe them. So it is easier to track how NGOs behave and whether or not their behavior has had any influence on the regulation and on specific go um, government officials than it is to develop you know, more, more causal, large and quantitative approaches. But our work, Amanda and my work, demonstrates that it is possible to estimate the degree to which these two phenomena linked with each other. And that means that we could have ascribe some degree of, if not causality, at least correlation between the two phenomena. That's great, uh, Raul, really painting some uh, concrete examples of how you've, you've applied this um, theory in, in your research. And I want to shift gears a little bit towards um, another area of your research. You've just been talking a lot about, you know, how to measure NGO influence in the field of global ecopolitics. Um, but you also do a lot of work at the intersection of waste management and governance of waste and also water governance and other topics which really get into theories about common pool resources. Um, and as I think you may know, you know, many courses in global environmental politics start off with this uh, examination of the commons and a critique of the commons. And it, it usually goes back to Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons, which I think has some problematic assertions about the commons, which we hope to discuss in some in more detail in some of the uh, future episodes in this series. But I'm curious to get your, your you know, first level take, your entry level take on theories about common pool resources and how you use these in the, in the classroom or in your research? Thank you, Brian. That's a really great question. I study a very weird or a very strange part of the commons. I not only study water, but I, in, I study waste. And I study waste as a form of an, what I call a negative commons. So that, in general, commons are goods that are subject to congestion. That means if everybody can access the same resource and there are no rules that govern the access, then obviously that resource, if it is exhaustible, what happens is that it's gonna get exhausted and depleted and we're not going to have enough for everybody. The classic example of a commons is fisheries. If we don't have the rules that govern those uh, the access to those fisheries, what's going to end up happening is that there will be there will be a number of fishers who are going to want to enter the fishery, and they may end up fishing too many of you know the entire uh, load of fish. So that means that there will be a point where there will be no more fish to actually be be able to process or or to even capture. Those are commons that have intrinsic value. I focus on resources that only gain value when we as humans undertake a process that gives them value. So waste, trash, refuse, garbage doesn't have inherent waste. We value it if we collect it and then not, on, not we dispose it, but we separate what becomes valuable and then recycle it. So that's an example of a negative commons. A negative commons, in my definition, is a commons that only gets value after it is revalued. And the ones who give revalue are human beings. So that's one of the things that I think is important that we differentiate. So yes, I, I do study water and I do study access to water, but a lot of my work is on bottled water, which gains value by being bottled, specifically in a bottle of plastic. I also study waste, which also gains value once it's recycled. And I also study wastewater, which also regains value once all the pollutants are being removed from the water. And then you can use those pollutants, either you know the excess energy to 
heat up heat exchangers or you know the biological material can be also used for irrigation and for you know uh, as a fertilizing uh, product so do they have inherent value no these negative commons do not have inherent value but there are they important of course and are they important at the global level even more important and one on my more more recent work, I'm also looking at climate as a global commons. I think that is an area of further research that needs to be more and more developed. And I think I, as a former collaborator of the Ostroms and, and her former students and former associates, will definitely work on extending their work into the global climate commons. Raul, you've been speaking about... Um ways of conceptualizing the commons and uh, approaching resource governance problems. And uh, I'm just on your, your website right now, raulpacheco.org. Um, and uh, the subtitle is Understanding and Solving Intractable Resource Governance Problems. And I see that you have a lot of uh, resources here. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to st students again about some of the types of resources that you have on, on your website. And what, what are you hoping that... Uh, students and, and colleagues can do with these resources? Thank you, Peter. This is such an important question and one that I don't get asked enough, so I'm so glad to have an opportunity to answer it. I develop a lot of resources in, you know, how to write, how to do literature reviews, how to use social media in academia, how to take notes, how to uh, read, how to write. Um, I started blogging because I thought, well, you know, this is another way of disseminating academic research. But then I started writing about how I take notes, how I um, how I teach my students how to, you know, have control over their grad studies and so on. There's always this assumption that students will know how to do a lead review, how to do an annotated bibliography. And I just like uncovering the, you know, the hidden curriculum. I yes, I am a, the son of a professor. My mother also has a PhD, but she had she did her PhD at the same time as I did, and at the same time as my oldest brother did. So um, none of us actually had any special insight into how to survive a PhD. More more funny, it's like you know we survived the PhD in in some ways um, by trial and error. And I just want to make things easier for the generations that are coming behind me and for my own students and for the students of other of my colleagues. So do I get a reward from that? Well, you know, I do. I really do. Well, that's great, Raul. And I really do appreciate uh, your sharing your the resources and the, the global public goods that, that, that offers, uh, that those are uh, offered to our students and, um, and to colleagues alike. We, we should wrap it up uh, for the sake of time. Um, just want to thank you again for sharing your thoughts. You've really helped us uh, kind of unpack these, the relationship between theory and method. You, you talked about how to apply theory. You talked about um, how to, you gave us some examples of applying methods within your own research. Uh, you tied this into questions of common pool resources. Um, and speaking of resources, you, you gave us a little sense of uh, what kinds of learning tools and resources you provide on your own website as a, as a global public good, uh, which we really appreciate. So we will leave it at that. Thank you once again. Um, and a quick reminder to our listeners that the podcast is made available under a Creative Commons license 2.0. Uh, please share it and use it widely. We just ask that you provide appropriate attribution. And please follow us uh, on Twitter at EcopoliticsP with a capital P. Uh, and Raul, where can they follow you on Twitter? Well, they can follow me on Twitter at, at Raul Pacheco. I couldn't, my last name is complicated enough to hyphenate it. So <laughs> <laughs> I just left it at that. And I just want to thank you, Ryan and, and, and Peter and the production team of Global Ecopolitics. So I just, it's been fantastic. So I just want to say this experience has been wonderful. And I look forward to maybe repeating this uh, when there's another chance. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Well, that wraps up the show. The Global Ecopolitics Podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning is provided by Kika Mueller. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. See you all in our next episode and stay tuned.